I wanted for very particular reasons to have a horizontal hive which was dedicated to the purpose, the one purpose of raising queens. And so I set off with the intention of building another zest hive or something very close to the zest hive using thermalite blocks. And you'll, you'll notice that I've made several uh, videos about the, the zest hive, uh, which is an interesting hive, which you probably should pay attention to if you're interested in treatment-free beekeeping, certainly and you have a site to put a hive that is essentially static. The, the problem I ran into was that I couldn't get hold of 600 millimeter long thermalite blocks because that's uh, pretty much an essential ingredient of the hive, especially for the floor. The rest of the hive you can actually build with the standard kind of 440 mil blocks. So I went to my local builder's merchant. I phoned up several builder's merchants, in fact, and apparently I, the, none of these things are around in the southwest at the moment, which was a bit odd, but uh, apparently they're still being made, but they're just not being supplied, I don't know why. So, having gone through that process, I then decided that I'd maybe try some other materials, and I've always had this idea that making a hive out of uh, what is variously called Kingspan or Celotex or this um, a urethane foam based insulation material that, that comes in various thicknesses. I've always felt, you know, it's, it's got to be a, a good target material for making lightweight uh, portable hives. And so this seemed to be an occasion where, well, okay, let's give it a whirl. Let's see if we can make a horizontal frame hive this time, not a top bar hive. Uh, because we've got a lot of um, frame equipment as well as top bar equipment. So I, I specifically wanted to make a frame hive based on the national f standard brood frame. And so this is an opportunity, I thought, to test my theory. Can we make a long horizontal frame hive, which is thermally efficient, that the bees like, that we can make relatively cheaply out of readily available material? So the insulating material I chose is, I'll just see if I can zoom into it without drama, here we go. Um, it's 50 millimeter thick, which is two inches in old money, uh, and for the benefit of Americans. Um, it's 50 millimeters thick and it's um, 1200 millimeters long, which is near as damn it four feet. So, well, that gives us the length of the hive. We want to, cut down on the height slightly from uh, the board which is actually 450 millimeters wide that's right so that's too deep for for our purpose but uh, it's, this stuff is easy to cut um, especially as I found with the um, the Japanese pull saw it cuts very cleanly through through that material so anyway that's the project um, we've got a, so we've got a pile of shiny stuff and a few bits of wood and we're going to build a stand we're going to build a roughly four foot long horizontal hive and we're going to stick the whole thing together with silicone adhesive and aluminium tape obviously so here goes now then i've i doodled some drawings this is my hive design here um, <laughs> Um, which I constructed in about 10 minutes flat yesterday, sitting in a cafe. So let's see, see what's going to become of this. Here's the uh, frame I'm going to be using. So what we want is the height of the frame. Height of the frame is 22 centimetres, 220 millimetres. I'm going to make the depth of the hive uh, 25 centimetres, 250 millimetres because I want some space underneath it. So that's our first cut. One of these is gonna be the floor, and then we're gonna mount two like this, and he cut down to uh, 250 mil high for the sides. And then we're gonna put ends and tops and stuff on it as well. This is called designing on the hoof. I'm wondering now whether we should try and make it deeper. We could make it 300 millimetres deep. The only reason for making it 250 was to comfortably accommodate the frames and leave enough spare 
insulation to run around this side of the lid because we want the lid to fit snugly. Okay, I've come to a decision. I'm going to make this 225 millimeters deep, which is comfortable for the British national frame. And it means I can use one of these pieces, which is 450, which is twice that. I can use one of them to do both sides, which reduces the overall cost. I've obviously bought this stuff already, so it's not gonna save me money, but I'm hoping that if anybody else decides to do this, it will save you some money. So, we're gonna cut one of these in half. Now I found through trial and error that the best saw for cutting this stuff, at least the one best one I found, is a Japanese draw saw, which is, uh, which is this beast. And you use the finer teeth on, along this edge. This is a pull saw, so you will see me pulling it. I'm going to keep the, the saw as vertical as I can because I want a nice clean straight edge. As you can see, it cuts very well, very cleanly and virtually effortlessly. Okay, so now we have our two sides. There they are. So this is how it's going to work in the end, right? So these frames are gonna sit directly on the edge of this. Well, in fact, what I'm gonna do is to put some aluminum tape along these edges to strengthen them because this stuff is quite soft and easily damaged. Now this, uh, this tape is the same width as the edge of the board. So I want to avoid any possibility of water ingress into this foam. So I am going to run an overlapping, two overlapping sections of tape. It's really useful stuff. Um, it's very, very sticky. It's got a very aggressive ad adhesive on it. Once you've stuck it to something, it ain't coming off in a hurry. So I'm overlapping the two pieces of tape in the center, or across the center of the, of the board and over the edges so that no water can get in. Okay, that's pretty much sealed. You may be wondering how I'm gonna finish the outside of this. To be absolutely honest, I'm wondering that as well. This um, aluminium finish, um, it's a, just a foil bonded to the foam, uh, obviously is waterproof because it's aluminium and it does in fact uh, reflect sunlight quite well. It doesn't seem to corrode noticeably in uh, ultraviolet light. Um, however, it's quite vulnerable to, to, to scratching and cutting and so on. And if you do penetrate this and water gets in, then the foam starts to deteriorate very quickly. It absorbs water, swells up and the whole thing, yeah, disintegrates rather rapidly. So I want to try and avoid that situation. Now it would be perfectly possible to make a version of this hive for Langstroth frames or for Dadent frames or for any type of frame you care to mention. You just have to find uh, insulation boards of the right size. I mean, you can buy this stuff in eight by four sheets. Sorry, that's eight feet by four feet for Americans. What is it, 2,400 by 1,200 for, um, for us metric users. And I almost did that, in fact, for this project. The, re the only reason I didn't do it was because the difference in price between uh, uh, how many did I buy? Six of these um, 
six of these small sheets did work out slightly more expensive than one big sheet of 50 mil, but um, it's, it was a lot easier to handle. I couldn't get the, uh, the big sheet in my car. That was the main problem. I could have cut it up on site, but I wasn't, ha wasn't prepared to make these kind of decisions uh, on the hoof in the actual builder's merchant. So this is what we ended up with. But if it's easy for you to buy a full sheet of this stuff and then cut it to whatever dimensions you choose, then that would be absolutely fine to do that. It might save you a couple of pounds. Some of you may be thinking, what's he gonna do about the fact that the frames are gonna be resting on the edge of this with nothing to stop weather getting in? Well, believe it or not, I have thought of that. What I mean is, Okay, here's our two sides, both identical height, nicely. So they're going to be sitting on this board like so. We've got to adjust the width just uh, uh, shortly. Um, the frames are going to sit like this with the statutory B space. And that's going to make the distance across the top of the hive slightly more than the width of the insulation board, which is a little bit of a nuisance, but it's something we can work with. The actual width of a British national standard national frame is, as you can see, 14 inches or 355 pretty much millimeters. Okay, so if we added, let's say we added a quarter of an inch each side for B space, which is mandatory as we know, because the bees have to have passage around the side of the frame. So if we made it 14 and a half inches between sides, that would be equivalent to 37, 370 millimeters, 37 centimeters, 370 millimeters. So 14 and a half inches is nearest diameter 370 millimeters. Now the board itself is 450 millimeters wide, which is 17 and three quarter inches. The thickness of the board is 50 millimeters. So we need to add a hundred to our, to our minimum width. So 370 becomes 470 and these boards are 450. So we're going to, we've got to add 20 millimeters or 10 millimeters each side to the width, which basically means that these sides have to overhang the base by 10 millimeters, uh, which is slightly annoying. Uh, it's one of those irritating little things, but uh, there's nothing we can do about it in, in this particular case. Obviously, if you're cutting the uh, if you're cutting these boards from a, from a big sheet, then you could adjust the width accordingly, but I can't do that. So I'm going to have to bodge it. So the first thing I need to do here is mark where these sides are going to go. And I'm going to do that from a center line, I think. So 450, so that's 225. I've just noticed on the um, back of the sheet here, it says uh, it's printed this side down. Does that matter? I've no idea is the answer to that. I can't really imagine that it does. Um, I can't imagine really that the bees care which way up it goes. Let's check and see if the foil's thicker on one side. I don't think so. It's certainly easier for me to work on this side because uh, it doesn't have fancy printing all over it. So I'm gonna stay with that. Okay, so there's our center line. 150 plus 35 is 185 and that's in each direction. I'll double check that maths. Um, twice 18 is 36 and two fives are 10 so that's 37 that's correct. So 100 
and 85 millimeters. We're going to mark down there. Could be easier to mark it in from here, actually, thinking about it. So that would be actually 40 millimeters in, uh, 40, 40, 80 from 450 is 370, that's right. So four centimeters in from each side is what we're looking for. <sighs> okay, so that's our lines marked up. I'm just gonna double check the internal width should be 37, correct. So this shows that we've got an overlap. So that board needs to be fixed in place along that line. And that's going to give me a centimetre or so overhang, um, which I still haven't made a decision about. I could run a piece of timber along there, which would give the whole thing a little bit more structural rigidity. It would add, add to the weight, of course, not that matters particularly. Dee, 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 dee. Uh, the adhesive I'm using here is called um, Instant Nails. Um, uh, and this should not be taken as a, an endorsement of any of this or any other product particularly. This is just what my local builders merchants supplied and uh, they didn't know what I was doing with it. So <laughs> they, they could hardly advise me uh, on hive building. Um, but I'm assuming that, you know, this stuff is uh, this stuff will do the job, we'll find out in due course. I'm also assuming, uh, hopefully not too rashly, that once this stuff is has gone off, once it's set, um, it's uh, not going to be giving off anything unpleasant that bees might take offence at. Um, I know that some of these, uh, some of these adhesives give off acetic acid, um, vapor for a while while they're wet um, it just happens that acetic acid i'm pretty sure has been found to be uh, toxic to varroa and fairly harmless to bees so i'm hoping that is in fact the case again uh, don't take my word for it do your own homework So I fitted, well I haven't fitted the ends, I've cut the ends the same height as the walls with the aim of putting pieces of this timber, which is I think fractionally short of uh, 50 mil. They're going to be glued across the ends like that for strength, both ends. And then I've cut a sliding fit divider and there's going to be at least one more, possibly two more of these. And they are also going to have these wooden uh, uh, strips glued or, and taped to the divider. But they're going to be sliding on there. So I'm going to cut them to the full width. And they're, they're going to basically hang from the sides like this. So the ends have to be glued in and taped up. And the uh, I've got to cut... I think two more of these, so that's my next job. Incidentally, um, I've cut these two millimeters short of the sections I cut for the end because they've got to slide. Uh, there needs to be a, um, a, a not a loose fit, but well, yeah, there will be a loose fit. There'll be a sliding fit in the in the hive. So I'm, I'm going to be taping up these sides tape and that will take up a little bit of the slack but I still need uh, room for them to move easily.
it's going to be very important that all possible means of ingress of water are sealed up um, one way or another and this aluminium tape is going to be doing the bulk of the work but uh, I will be making sure that any cracks and crevices are filled I could probably use the 25 mil insulation for this job but it just doesn't have the structural rigidity that the 50 mil does I could have gone thicker and used the 75 or even the 100 mil thickness and um, that would have been you know so much better in terms of insulation but uh, very much more expensive and uh, a much bulkier end product so I, I thought the 50 was about right now um, as I said at the beginning, this hive is predominantly for queen rearing, which means I would want to divide the hive probably into three sections. Um, I've given myself, uh, because I've got the materials available, uh, I've actually made myself four dividers um, with the thought that it's possible at some stage that I might use this hive um, for queen mating, in which case I would need, I could divide it into in this case five sections and have an entrance for each section and I could make one queen in each section um, so that's a you know I'm just keeping my options open here so the next thing is going to be cutting the uh, this stuff the 47 by whatever it is uh, it'll say on it somewhere here we go 19 by 46 in fact not 47 I'm going to be cutting that into 450 mil sections two are going to be fixed to the ends like that as stops and then the rest are going to, each of these dividers are going to have one section attached to it so that it can be used to divide the hive up. Now, something I've got to bear in mind is that if I'm going to put uh, a strip of wood along the edge here, I need, would need to know what dimension that was so I can cut this to appropriately to length because uh, it's going to have to fit, obviously, inside that. Um, so I'm going to have to... Uh, figure that one out before I go any further in fact I'll cut the ends and that'll be give me something to do with it for now incidentally if you can hear helicopters and jet planes in the background it's because uh, we're in a an area used by the Air Force for practice runs against uh, who knows, foreign enemies, I expect. Right, I'm going to use a different Japanese saw for this operation. I'm going to use the Dazuki. cleanest cut I've seen this year. It's better. Right, there's an end piece. I'm going to have another one just the same. Okay, so I've made a decision about this uh, runner and I'm going to use this wooden strip cut to exact length and the frames are going to rest on that wooden strip. In fact, the plastic, I use plastic uh, spacers which are going to rest on the wooden strip and that's going to give me the, uh, give me the right spacing and the right height. the frame rests on it as a rail. The, in fact, the, the frame ends rest on it. I use these plastic frame ends to get uh, the right spacing. I'll talk more about that at some point. But the important thing is 
The reason I made that decision was because, two reasons really. One is um, it's good to have a firm and permanent surface, relatively speaking, for resting your frames on. But also, uh, which, and it saves wear and tear on this uh, edge here, on the aluminium tape. Um, but also because underneath the ends of the frame, there is enough of a gap for bees to walk underneath without getting squashed. Because there's always a danger with frames is when you put them down is you're going to trap bees under the ends of the frames. With this system, that's not going to happen because they can actually sit on the edge here and not be damaged by clumsy beekeepers. So that was my reasoning. So I've glued those strips in place. Um, I'll need to probably apply some more sealant to the outside just to make, be sure that that's, they're going to stay where they're put. Um, but that does mean it gives me a little bit more work because I've got to shape the ends of the uh, these pieces. I've got to sh they're going to sit in the, the same groove, obviously, because they've got to provide a, a complete seal to bees, um, which means I've got to cut these accurately to size and I've got to shape the ends easily enough with a chisel um, or, or a saw even. I've just got to chop a little bit out of the corners at the end so they sit snugly over there. So that's my next job. So these pieces are going to be cut to the same length as the frame with my trusty Dazuki. For the same reason that the base is slightly narrower than the sides, the width of the sides, uh, likewise of course uh, we can't just put a piece on the top and call it a lid because uh, that also needs to overlap the sides. So that's a problem I've yet to solve, um, but I will, that will be my next problem. There we go. So that sits on there, that's glued to there. Good to go. Right, so my proposed solution to the roof is as follows. I'm going to cut one of these boards, which is 450 by 1200, into three equal sections longitudinally, lengthwise. So each of these sections, two of them are going to form the sides of, uh, of the roof. They're going to overlap the box and one is going to be cut into the right size to take the ends. Now, obviously, the roof board is uh, slightly narrower than the hive, which is obviously going to be an issue because that means the roof isn't going to fit by just dropping it over. So what I'm going to do to make the roof wider is I'm simply going to glue a length of this wood um, along the side of one, yeah, one side of the roof and that actually creates just the right width to then fix the sides of the roof, either side, one on top of the wood, one directly against the board uh, to make an, a nice tight, well, be almost airtight fit onto the hive. Um, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm just going to apply some short pieces of aluminium tape just to hold the thing together while the glue sets.
This aluminium tape is really very effective and uh, there'd be a case I would say for using a wider one. I'm only using 50 mil wide tape and I would say the 75 or even the 100 mil wide version might be better in, in some places. The 75 mil is quite easy to manage. I honestly, we probably wouldn't go wider than that because it does become difficult to handle after that size. But 75 mil would work nicely because it would just mean one layer of tape would overlap both sides of a 50 mil uh, edge. Okay, so that's about it um, for the the main structure. I've got that little corner there has got to be tidied up. It just remains for me to do the finishing work on it and to build a stand. I've got the timber to build the stand. Cost-wise, um, pretty inexpensive project. In terms of high volume, uh, I would say it's pretty economical. Uh, it's um, it's equivalent to nearly three brood chambers uh, in British national sizes, and uh, that's going to hold a lot of bees. I'm not obviously it's not going to be ever going to be absolutely full, but you know it's that kind of volume. Um, Cost-wise, those insulation boards are just over six pounds each. I've used five of them, so that's thirty quid for the uh, insulation boards. Uh, the aluminium tape is quite cheap actually it's a couple of quid a reel I'm going to get through at least another probably two reels by the time I'm done um, but again you know very minimal cost the timber I think I paid a couple of pounds per length of that uh, 46 by 18 I think it was and I've still got some left um, hello hello dog that's a rather elderly whippet who's uh, who likes to be around people. So, what else? I haven't done the entrances yet. That's something that one or two of you may have noticed. <laughs> There's no entrances to this hive. Um, but there will be, and they'll be on the sides, and they'll be just under the level of the overhanging roof. Um, so that will provide a bit of uh, shelter for them, and they will be not at floor level. Okay, they're going to be higher entrances uh, than floor level but they'll be about halfway up i guess the 50 mil board is a very easy one to work with it's very easy to cut it's very light um, it's substantial it gives a good insulation uh, value for the hive and i can't see any reason you know to use anything thicker than that really this hive is really for summer use it's for queen rearing Obviously, if you want to build your own hives like this, which you certainly could, this, this could be applied to any hive. I mean, you could just build straightforward, um, you know, brood boxes using this material, I reckon. Um, and you could develop your own system for, uh, for the edges where the frames rest, or you could use the system that I've used. It's, uh, it's very versatile. Uh, it's very economical. It's a lot cheaper than buying uh, hives and if you want something a bit different a bit uh, unusual like this you know this long horizontal for queen rearing um, then I, I can't really think of a better way of doing it because if I could think of it I'd have done it that way I'm just gonna patch up that corner yeah it's really sticky stuff this if it if it sticks to itself on the glue side, you'll never get it apart. But it's great for patching up little bits like that because, you know, instant fix really. And any time you spot a, a little hole or a tear or something in the surface, just slap some aluminium tape on it and it's good again. This, this roof is a cosy fit, I would call it. Um, it. There's a case for making it a slightly sloppier fit, I would say, 
in practice when you've got bees in it you don't want to risk uh, shocking them by having to knock the roof off uh, in, in a hurry uh, they wouldn't like that I'm gonna yeah there's a raw edge you can see all the way around here which I've got to tape up that's my next job this tape sticks seems to stick as well to the foam surface as it does to the aluminium foil surface so it should do a good job of keeping water out of the foam which is its function am I going to paint it well maybe I don't want it to be an eyesore so I guess I might paint paint it um, how what with not sure um, I don't think water-based paint is going to take to this aluminium surface I haven't actually honestly experimented with it to find out I suppose I could use a you know, spray paint acrylic or um, you know car paint effectively maybe I'll paint it in camo colors make it disappear just to show you what I've done with the dividers uh, that's a block of that of the foam board there's a piece of wood glued to the top with the uh, no more nails or whatever it's called instant nails and you can see it's got uh, these rebates in it to take the edge of the runners and the whole thing is completely encased in aluminium using the tape uh, I'll probably neaten it up a little bit but it, the essential thing is to make it completely watertight and that way um, that no harm is going to come to it the wooden rails along the sides of what the frame ends rest on there's little gaps underneath for the bees to be able to um, escape from being crushed um, these dividers are a close enough fit to stop bees getting past them which is obviously important if you're using this for the intended purpose of queen rearing the hive itself is quite rigid and quite stable it's not going anywhere in a hurry it's heavy enough not to get blown around too much but obviously with bees in it it's going to be heavier still i would tend to strap it down definitely to to the stand so uh, thinking about this hive overnight i made a few changes as a result of my thinking and uh, one of the changes which you may or may not be able to spot is that i've shortened the roof in other words i've made the roof less deep um, on this dimension here uh, it was 150 millimeters or six inches in old money and now it's more like 100 so i've cut roughly two inches 50 millimeters off the bottom of it um, reason being that it was quite difficult to get on and off the hive um, because of the uh, substantial overlap is about 100 mil overlap um, on the over the edge of the hive and it made it quite difficult to lift and to re, re, uh, to, to, to place on the hive because um, it's almost an airtight fit and uh, it took quite a lot of uh, effort to shift it so anyway that's one thing so I've sawn that off and um, re-taped the roof now so the edges are all sealed with aluminium tape as you can see and obviously hives need entrances and so I've opted for relatively high entrances on the side of the hive as you can see here um, there's three holes this side there's one hole at each end and there are two holes this side and those are all arranged so that I can organize the hive if I choose to into um, up to five sections so if I'm mating queens for example I can have a, a, a section here I'm going to talk about these holes in the floor in a minute uh, this this entrance hole here uh, will, will service this this uh, nu nucleus here then this one here will be able to use this entrance here this central section can use up to three entrances um, but they can easily be closed by simply moving 
a divider board over them. So there's three entrances. So when I'm using it for queen rearing, for example, I'll probably have um, the main colony in the centre and I'll need more than one entrance. So that's the reason for three. And then back over here, there's an entrance here for this section and an entrance at the end for this section. So each of the five compartments, if I run it for five, with five compartments, would have at least one entrance hole. Um, and these dividers are movable, so you can change the number of frames in each section. And also, obviously, the number of sections, we're simply removing these. Uh, you'll notice that I've taped the edges of these uh, dividers and that's to prevent water getting in obviously and they have a, a snug fit should we say a sliding fit on the side so it's bee proof bees can't get past those dividers uh, right let's talk about these holes um, okay my thinking was that um, because this hive is essentially a watertight tank really and an, as it stands, without those holes in the floor, I could fill this with water and it would hold water. So, um, not that that's my intention, of course. So, in fact, uh, with bees in there and incoming nectar and so on, I thought it must it, it's possible that you're going to get condensation on the walls because these walls are obviously aluminium, therefore waterproof. So, where's that water going to go? Well, before I put these holes in the floor that it didn't go anywhere and it just formed a puddle in the bottom which is not ideal it's not what we want so then my next thinking was okay well if I put holes in the floor then we're going to have a problem with water seeping into the foam and causing it to go soggy and horrible and not be any use to anybody so there then what I thought okay well let's line these holes Let's make holes and let's line them. And so this is actually lined with um, a pipe, plastic pipe, PVC pipe, that just fits snugly in a hole that I bored in the floor. And it's sealed with this black uh, sticky stuff, which is uh, silicone uh, ad adhesive and, you know, silicone filler um, that builders use. So it's watertight, I hope, and it's also... Uh, an effective drain. Now of course obviously if you have holes that size in the floor uh, the bees are going to use them as entrances and also wasps are going to be able to get in there so obviously we can't have holes. So my next thinking was well how about if I glue uh, say a nylon mesh over the hole and I thought well okay that's that not, not a bad idea um, and then I thought well how about using natural materials so I thought well let's let's use sphagnum moss because it's uh, it's uh, it's very common around here I mean there's li literally tons of it growing only a couple of miles from here um, and it can be squeezed and squashed into these holes uh, because that will mean that water can still percolate through it if necessary the moss itself will become a resource for the bees so they can actually drink um, from the water on the moss and, and I see them doing that quite frequently anyway so I know they like to do that uh, and also because obviously moss is is, is uh, readily available here in Devon up on the moor which is just across there and uh, yeah so an, an, a readily available uh, natural resource and I thought well let's use that so that's my plan we're going to stuff those holes with sphagnum moss and see what happens because this is all experimental of course as pretty much everything else I do is experimental uh, this is no exception so there we go sphagnum moss in there what else have I done um, oh I built a stand um, so it's just got a very simple um, it's it's all screwed together it's treated timber so it doesn't rot it's going to come into contact with the ground more or less although I will probably stand it on on flat rocks or bricks or something to level it up the uh, stand is just slightly shorter than the hive and I will be strapping the hive to the stand because uh, otherwise, who knows, it might get blown off. Uh, there's a very old sleepy dog over there who's having a nap in the sun. The other thing I've done since yesterday is to apply aluminium tape 
pretty much over the entire surface area just to make sure everything's nice and watertight and uh, now it looks like something out of a 1950s sci-fi movie I think um, so I may want to spray it with uh, with something to camouflage it a bit um, and I think the only paint that's going to stick to that surface is going to be uh, an aerosol acrylic or, or um, you know car type paint so we'll see about that and I'll maybe get some and, and give it a coat of paint before we use it but now it's pretty much ready to go so uh, we will be deploying this in the next few days um, at our mating apiary. Uh, it's going to be our primary queen rearing hive, and we may also use it for queen mating, which is uh, which is why I've got so many compartments in it. The one thing I've got left to do is to make a queen excluder. Uh, well, I, I've got, obviously got queen excluders, um, but I've got to cut one to fit. Um, the same size as one of these dividers so that's that's another job I've got to do and uh, what I may do there is to make up another one of these dividers and then cut a hole in it uh, with and, and embed the queen excluder in the hole that's that's my likely scenario but we'll see how that works out okay so uh, the last fight oh finally um, this is um, good old reflectix which is going to be the the skin over the top of the uh, of the frames so we can peel it back and check the bees I might cut that in half or maybe even thirds to make it easier to handle so we can take off sections of it uh, rather than having to set the whole thing off but that's going to be a, a detail I'll address at some point soon um, what I've done with this actually is to tape the edges with the aluminium tape again because what ten tends to happen with the Reflectix is that it tends to delaminate uh, the layers come apart uh, from the edges and uh, the whole thing disintegrates so I'm hoping that the aluminium tape will stop that happening. Total cost currently UK pricing um, I would say under £50 maybe just under but around say between 40 and £50 total cost which isn't bad for a hive that's well equivalent to um, at least two and possibly nearly three uh, UK national brew chambers. You could of course make a Langstroth version of this, I hope somebody does because I think it's a, an interesting technique and uh, you could also of course make um, top bar hives out of the same material and maybe I'll do that one of these days. Certainly it's great material if you were making nukes, if you're making up nukes um, this would be a really useful technique because you can make a number of nuke boxes uh, very cheaply um, this way and uh, if you need the if you need to to move bees around for any reason or if you need to make up nucleus colonies and really all beekeepers should be thinking along those lines whoops winds blowing off um, all beekeepers should be thinking along those lines um, it's really useful to have uh, you know if you, even if you've only got one hive um, you really should be thinking about having one hive and one nucleus because then you've always got spare parts you know, You've always got a, a spare queen if something goes wrong with your main queen. You've got a spare one ready to go um, So for that and many other reasons, I would recommend having a, at least one new box handy So here we are at my mating apiary and here is my shiny new queen rearing hive installed in place as you may be able to see, I've, I've strengthened the uh, stand a little bit, just give it a bit of uh, cross bracing. Um, although, obviously, this hive is extremely light, nevertheless, um, accidents will happen. Um, here is the colony. Yeah, I, I was up here, I brought the hive up here the other day, and uh, lo and behold, there was a swarm hanging from some uh, fencing wire. And so I popped it in here, but I, I didn't have my camera with me, unfortunately, otherwise I could have filmed the whole process. But as you can see, they're using the side entrance here. Um, they have actually got available this end entrance, but nobody seems to be using it. So they've actually got two entrance holes into there. Um, as you can see, pretty busy um, doing their thing. So I'm going to unstrap them and uh, see what's going on in there. The reason I cut the 
lid down. I made the roof less deep uh, for the reason that it was very difficult to actually lift the roof off. It was nearly an airtight fit. So, but now just with that much smaller 50 millimeter or so um, overhang, it's very easy to lift off with one hand, as you can see. So I'm just going to take it off completely and uh, just rest it over there for a moment while we have a look at these bees. So they've got about, I don't know, a third of the hive. I've just put some frames in there. You can see here they are doing their thing. Um, they're ignoring most of the frames, actually. They seem to be just clustered on these frames right here uh, beside that uh, entrance. Um, they're fairly tatty old frames. They're just what I happen to have handy at the time, but they'll be fine. Um, bees themselves are uh, active, but not, um, not in a bad way. Um, these are actually, <laughs> these are, this is a swarm from my own bees, so, you know, um, it wouldn't look good if they were <laughs> horrible, would it? So, there's, there's, there's quite a few drones in there. Um, act, the, the, the workers are active. Um, I'm just wonder, wondering if, um, if I take one of these frames out, we can have a look and see what they're up to. There's some bees here, daisy chaining, ready to make comb. On the next one, they are busy again building comb. It's pretty, yeah, I apologise for the state of the comb. It's, it's an old comb, but they will build on it. Um, I'm thinking, looking at them, they're probably hungry, so I'm going to give them some food in a minute. Um, but meanwhile, I just wanted to show you that they seem quite comfortable in here. Um, it's, I can feel the heat, um, which is always the case when they're, when they're building comb, they get together and they generate heat um, in order to, to uh, activate their wax production glands. Um, so I'm not going to leave this open for, for long because that's what's going to get in their way. And this is the Swagman Moss plug which I mentioned in the construction video. Slightly damp as it generally is in Devon. If any moisture does build up in here, I kind of think it won't, but if it does, it can drain away through that um, moss. Um, that will also have the effect of keeping the moss moist so that uh, the bees can take water from it as, as required. I interesting that already there's a, there's a wood louse growing around inside, you know, they, they occur in just about every hive I ever open. Uh, bees don't seem to mind, they don't seem to mind bees, they're pretty well armoured, um, I can't imagine that bees have a problem with them. But it shows you that you can make a well insulated hive at low cost from easily readily available materials and the bees are just as happy in here as they are in any other hive. So. Why not? This construction is actually giving me some ideas about making um, some small nukes as well. I mean, I've got I've got quite a few mating nukes. So I don't really need any more, but um, it, this method, this construction method, uh, has sort of intrigued me, and I think I will um, just for fun <laughs> and to uh, you know get, maybe give you some ideas. Um, I'm going to do some other things with it and uh, well we'll see how that works out. Meanwhile I'm very happy with this so far um, it's very sturdy very stable and uh, of course the lid's strapped on because a gust of wind could theoretically remove it but um, it doesn't actually get that much windy up here we're well sheltered as you can see There's trees all around uh, there's a very old uh, hazel here which is um, got covered in, in sphagnum moss which of course is a it is a useful source of moss for my um, for those plugs that I was talking about into in the in the hole in the floor hole and uh, right across the river here I say river it's a stream it's across the river bridge so there's a little stream right here they've got plenty of water uh, they love to go on to damp moss to, to drink and there's some loaded engines here which aren't ideal because uh, there are stories that rhododendron is it the pollen or the nectar I can't remember it's supposed to be a bit toxic to bees but yeah that, that's uh, hopefully not a serious issue I've never had anything that you know, looks like a problem from those 
Um, right up on the moor beyond here is loads and loads of gorse, which flowers periodically through the year, um, including right through the winter. Um, gorse is interesting. I'm just going to move away from the stream because it's uh, it's kind of noisy. Apparently gorse has a pollen with a very high protein content, which is uh, very useful for bees early in the spring. And gorse flowers pretty much throughout the year um, in, a, in a kind of patchy way. Um, but there's usually gorse available uh, within the reach of this apiary at any time of year. So they can always go and find some good high quality pollen. Nectar, well, not so much. Nectar is a little bit more scarce up here. There's lots of wildflowers, of course, especially in my apiary because I've, I manage the apiary um, to in encourage biodiversity. Down here you can see, oh, forget-me-nots, wild strawberries, all sorts of things. Uh, it's, there were more flowers a while ago. Uh, I think this is uh, Bugloss, I believe. Um, there's a lot of flowers in here, um, but this is only a small area, so I do rely on the bees being able to fly out onto the moor and forage for themselves. But they seem to do well up here, bees overwinter here quite happily, and uh, so I have every, every faith in, uh, in it continuing to be so, although our, our weather is, well, somewhat unpredictable here. Uh, it's predictably unpredictable, shall we say. Uh, bees up here do okay, and they have to be kind of looked after because there is always the danger of um, running out of food, so we do have to keep an eye on them. There's uh, brambles here, that blackberry, uh, which is going to be in flower quite soon, I would say, but certainly within 10 days, maybe less, uh, which will be a valuable food, food source for them. They love blackberry flowers. Over there, there's uh, elder, which they don't go to, as far as I can tell. I've never seen bees on elder. There's some foxgloves over there, but they're really um, bumblebee flowers. They're, they're deep tubes. Um, I've seen bumblebees going into them quite frequently, but rarely, if ever, have I seen a honeybee in there. So there we are, time to put the lid back on and let them get on with their lives. And I'll be back again, I think, to feed them quite soon because they're looking a bit uh, peckish, should we say. But this hive's been performing well so far. We obviously haven't done the queen rearing in it yet, but that will be the next stage. But I just wanted to show you that, uh, you know, bees seem to have to be quite happy in there. Um, and uh, I hope that continues. So I hope this has given you some ideas. As I say, it's given me some ideas, so I shall be making more videos based on this construction method, I think. Um, I would maybe, maybe just mention, I did give the outside, uh, although not the lid, I just gave it a coat of uh, matte grey paint. I know it's maybe not the prettiest thing in the world, but um, I might uh, give it another colour change at some point, just to, you know, maybe green or something. Uh, <laughs> Um, I haven't bothered painting the lid. I actually ran out of paint, that was the truth of it. So um, it's got a shiny lid for the time being, but that's okay.